So as you know, uh, from this morning's gospel reading, uh, and its lesson is so important that we read it at this time every year. We read it at least once a year. And we read it on what we call the Sunday of the Triodio. And the Triodio, and I've talked to you about before, you know it's a liturgical book. It's a book that contains thousands of hymns, hundreds of scripture readings that takes us all the way from today, three weeks before Lent begins, all the way through Great Lent, all the way through Holy Week, up until Easter night. And then Easter night, we get a new book called the Pentecostalium. So, today, in a certain sense, is the announcement by the church that Lent is around the corner. Now, you know the story. Again, you know it, I'm sure, well. Two men go up to the temple in Jerusalem to pray. One is a Pharisee. In other words, someone who is professionally religious, a student, and a teacher of the law of Moses. A man who believes that he keeps the externals of the law perfectly, flawlessly. And the other is a publican, a tax collector, collaborator with the oppressive Roman regime that ruled the world at that time, a thief, an extortionist who stole money from his own people, a pariah whose only concerns in life were his wealth, his status, and his power. Now it's important for us to understand why Jesus told this story. The Bible says in just a few verses before we actually read the parable that we read this morning, that Deacon Dan read this morning, it says there that the Lord Jesus told this parable to some people who thought they were righteous and looked down on everybody else. Now, in other words, he told this story to some people who used the keeping of the externals of religion to look good to everybody else, people who used religion to shore up their own ego, to feed their arrogance, so they could feel justified in looking down on everybody else. So it's important for us to understand this and to get this right. These two guys went to the temple to pray, and clearly not all prayer is the same. Not all prayer is of equal value. Not all prayer, just because we might think it's prayer, is even good, right, and true. It is possible to pray rightly. Yes, absolutely. But it's also possible to pray wrongly. Let me repeat that. It's possible even to get prayer wrong. Everything depends on the attitude of mind and heart that we bring to our prayer. And when we pray wrongly, our relationship with God goes wrongly. And when our relationship with God goes wrong, all of our other relationships go wrong as well. And that's what this story, this parable that Jesus tells is all about. So the Pharisee, he enters into the temple precincts and he stands and he prays, the scriptures say, Prose afton. Literally, he prays to himself. He's not really praying to God at all. He begins by praying, Thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of everything I get. Now, you had to pay attention, and I hope you heard it. This prayer is not about praising God. It's about singing his own praises. Everything in his prayer is about himself. How wonderful he is how holy he is, how good he is. Thank God, he says, you, O Lord, have made me so wonderful. The Pharisee's prayer places himself at the center of his prayer. Although he uses the word God, he's actually worshiping at the altar of self. God is way out on the periphery somewhere. And his prayer, at best, is talking at God but certainly not talking to God. His whole attitude is typical of the worst mistake you can possibly make in prayer. Praying to glorify ourselves rather than the living God. In fact, 
we would even say that the Pharisee's prayer isn't really prayer at all. He's just rehearsing in his own mind his own sense of superiority over everyone else. His prayer is not righteous, but self-righteous. Now, notice he does all the right things. He fasts twice a week. Orthodox Christians are supposed to do that. He tithes, even. That's something we're also called to do. But he does them for the wrong reasons. He does them to feed his ego. And that's the problem. And that's what the Lord Jesus is going after in telling us this parable. This lack of humility, this lack of anything approaching God, his arrogance, it's not merely an attitude that this Pharisee had some 2,000 years ago. Often it's an attitude that we have today. We live in a culture of publicity, self-promotion, and endless self-praise. And we are not, well, I was going to ask that as a question, but I'll make it rhetorical. Are we not taught by our culture, by the values of this fallen world, as John writes in his first letter, that in fact I am at the center of the universe? I am number one, and that I should come first in everything. Now remember, children, babies, start out this way. And then little by little, as good parents, we teach our children to share their toys, to consider the needs of others, to develop some sense of humility and the recognition that I am not the center of the universe. Humility is an absolute necessity if we're going to avoid acting like babies all our lives. To grow up means to become humble, to throw away the illusion that I am at the center of the universe. But unfortunately, some people, even some religious people, never truly grow up. And it's not a matter of age. So let me tell you this story about St. Theophan the Recluse. You know then that he was a Russian Orthodox saint of the 19th century. He wrote many amazing books, one even called The Art of Prayer. He translated the Philokalia into Russian. He was once asked this question. Why is it that some religious people who go to church every Sunday, kiss all the icons, seem to know all the prayers, why is it that they seem to become worse instead of better? Why do they become less merciful and more judgmental? Why do they seem to be less peaceful and compassionate and more irritated and angry all the time? Why do they seem less humble and more arrogant and more vain? Why does all this stuff go on with some religious people? St. Theophon was actually asked that question. And his answer should scare us all. He said, because even though they go through the motions, they don't really want God. Let me repeat that. They don't really want God. That's key. We can come to church, but our prayer can still be that of the Pharisee. Again, although he used the word God in his prayer, he was actually worshiping at the altar of self, the most subtle and most dangerous form of idolatry. We have to want the real God, not the God we make up to suit ourselves. We don't really want Jesus coming into our lives and telling us to do certain things, like Love our enemies. That's really hard. I don't want to do that. Jesus, why are you asking me to do that? Just let me keep worshiping at the altar of myself so I can feel good about myself. Not possible. So it's possible for us, even for us as Christians, to be here for the wrong reason. We want to use God. We want to shore up our egos. We want to use Jesus for our own purposes. St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and you know that the Corinthians are my crazy ancestors. You know that he had to write two letters to straighten them out. He says, examine yourself to see whether your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. So we as Christians constantly need to ask this question of ourselves. Are we really in this for God? 
Are we really in this because we want God's mercy? Because we want to be forgiven and healed so that we can then become God's instruments of mercy, forgiveness, and healing for everyone around us. Do we really want to be humble? Do we really want to be humble? Recognizing that we can't be healed by ourselves, that we can't do life on our own by ourselves, and that we need help. That should be why all of us are here, that we are drowning and that we desperately need a savior. And the saints are clear, without humility, there's no salvation. Now the ending of the parable is pretty clear. The Lord Jesus says that the tax collector, the tax collector, grasping, greedy, an obvious sinner hated by his own people, who fear him and the soldiers he brings with him to collect their taxes, who does not even dare to enter the temple precincts, but standing far off, the scriptures say, ashamed of himself, brokenhearted, not even able to look up, prays, God, forgive me a sinner. O Theos, to martolo. Now that's a phrase that the priest prays numerous times quietly to himself all throughout the liturgy. I would even encourage you to do that as well. So for example, just before the great entrance, when you see the three of us, Father Theophanes, Deacon Dan, and myself, we bow before the altar three times before turning and asking you to forgive us. When we're bowing before the altar, each time we're saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Exactly the prayer of the publican, the tax collector. Now, it was the humility of the tax collector that set him at rights with God. The presence of God was like a mirror, and it should be this for us as well. A mirror in which he could clearly see the state of his own soul. And in his case, it wasn't a pretty sight. He had the courage to admit that he was a sinner, that he was completely screwed up, that he was desperately in need of a savior. It was the tax collector, Jesus said, who returned to his home forgiven, justified, and loved, accompanied by God himself, who, as St. Paul wrote, came into the world to save sinners. It was the tax collector who was aware of how broken he was, how sick he was, who cried out to God for mercy. He was the one that was made right in the eyes of God. Now there is a saying by Saint Sinkritiki, Ama Sinkritiki, a fourth century desert mother. She lived out in the deserts in Egypt. And this is what she said. Just as one cannot build a ship without nails, so it is impossible to be saved without humility. It is impossible to be saved without humility. Humility is essential. Why? Because humility actually makes us more and more like the Lord Jesus himself, who described himself as meek and humble of heart. So even if we're lousy at fasting, inattentive in prayer, lax in forgiving other people, there will still be hope for us in the Lord who justified a crummy, stinking, lousy, rotten, no good, crooked tax collector. A man who acknowledged the sad truth about himself and cried out to God from the depths of his heart for mercy. So like the tax collector, we have to humble ourselves and cry out to God for mercy. Like the tax collector, we must make no excuses about who and what we are, who and what we do. Like the tax collector, we must judge no one but ourselves, unlike the Pharisee. We must never use our faith as a pretext for feeding our egos and judging other people. If we can do this, like the tax collector, repent, and return to our own homes, we'll be forgiven and justified by the incomprehensible love and mercy 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.